welcome to the first session of the series The Vital Approach. Now that we have understood the background of the Vital Approach and are familiar with the schedules of kingdoms and miasms, we will explain how exactly the Vital Approach is applied in case taking. Just as Harman writes in the Organon, the anamnesis is roughly divided in three stages each with its own particular approach. We will explain how the expressions of the vital can be discovered on all levels, from the physics to the mental-emotional. Enjoy this session. Anna, in your explanation on the vital approach, you talked about the levels you said you now work with the levels. I wonder, did this have a big impact on your analysis technique? And can you tell us if this analysis technique changed a lot over the years? Oh, it sure did. Um, I was trained in a classical way. This meets with organon and uh, with recommendations of Hahnemann, uh, who says, as you know, that for um, that the prescriber uh, needs uh, a lot of common sense. Uh, a good knowledge of the human nature, uh, a lot of patience, and he needs fidelity in tracing the picture of the disease. Then, this was the theory, then I saw a lot of uh, masters in homeopathy uh, in seminars actually showing their cases and, and doing their analysis and practice uh, the way it should be done. And then later I, I trained students and um, we, we, we taught them not to use the questionnaires that we used to use in the beginning because there were uh, almost books with 50 or 100 questions, I don't know, and the advantage at that time um, was so-called the, the, the reason why it was given, that the patient would think about the possible questions because a homeopath can ask a lot of questions. and. Um, that you don't have to ask them during consultation, but of course you have to read them afterwards. The disadvantages were more important. The um, analysis had to be an individualizing um, research for the core, and then we gave the patient all the same questionnaire, which was a bit contradictory. So we told them not to uh, use the questionnaires, but to follow the patient wherever he wanted to go and observe um, very accurately and not uh, put any leading question, no su suggested questions, only open questions. And all this is still accurate uh, until today, but of course my clinical experience was added to it. Okay, okay so your, your clinical experience led to uh, more uh, or better techniques in analysis, but you didn't uh, use the vital approach in the beginning. No, 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 of course not. No, the vital approach is kind of new, maybe, I don't know, since seven years or something. I, I use this expression because I feel, I told you, it's a blend of my personal experience and, and, uh, and style, and I can't use the, uh, the name of my masters, uh, of course, who learned me everything, ex except my personal uh, edition. So, in the beginning, Classically trained, uh, I tried to, as every homeopath did at that time, to find the totality of the symptoms, which was the whole picture. What we did was then extract as much information as we could from the patient, then um, use these symptoms, in, of, pour them into rubrics, and then make a repertorization, and then give uh, the most or the best matching. Remedy. If, what, if it was not possible to find the totality because the patient wouldn't give you anything else, he only would talk about pathology or he was a bit reluctant to talk about himself, then we used generalities, modalities, and if we had them, the keynotes. This was what we did. Then later, Vitulkas came, I'm talking of the early 80s now, with this idea uh, of the essence of the patient, like a broader picture, an, an overall personality. Uh, description of the patient, not a, a, a loose bundle of um, uh, rubrics and symptoms, but a person of flesh and blood. So it was much more fun. We could recognize real persons like your mother-in-law and your neighbor. And we could see them in our remedy pictures. And then later, 
uh, in the 90s, let's say, Sankran came with this idea of his basic delusion, which he found in the classical books in our repertories, but he saw more in it than we did, which is uh, genial. And he saw the the reason behind the behavior, or he was looking for the emotion behind the emotion and came to the delusion, the unconscious conviction. And, and this was, um, let's say, a deeper understanding of the same thing. Mm. And then the outcome, was it different then, of your uh, analysis? But the outcome depends on uh, what the homeopath is looking for in the first place and, uh, and, and the skill of the homeopath in the second place. So um, I have a blog where I uh, wrote uh, an extended introduction <laughs> on philosophical matters because I think it's very important to, to explain, to know, to be aware of your worldview, your inner map, eh, in order to to be aware of your definitions, the content of your definitions, because your definitions will determine what you are looking for. And if you are unconscious of it, they will determine as well, but you won't know. And then you think it's evident, but it's not. There are diff different possibilities. It's already in the organ, you know this aphorism, if the physician clearly perceives what is to be cured in disease. So what is to be cured in disease is what we should know. Eh? What are we trying to cure? It, it looks evident, but it's not so, so simple. And anyway, I needed a few um, pages, maybe 20, <laughs> to explain what is behind, um, what is happening in the homeopath's mind, yeah, in his uh, uh, conscious awareness of what he is looking for. Because if we this is the first condition. If we don't know what we are looking for, how will we know when we found it? Eh? So that's the first thing. Then the, the skill of the homeopath is of course important, but that will improve by time and, and by practice. That's normal. The most important is knowing where you're heading. Eh? And I'm the kind of homeopath who believes in the similimum. Not everybody is looking for the similimum, but I always did trying to find the best remedy for this particular patient. And the, the, so the remedy that matches the best. Only my definition of what is the similimum eh, and is the most individual in the patient evolved and deepened throughout the years. So it actually it evolved from uh, personality oriented to vital oriented. Yes, that's what it did. So in the beginning it was Vitulkas, more... When I was trained, Vitulkas came famous. And so we all very enthusiastically used his new insights because it was so much more fun, it was so much more um, understandable, it was so much more closer to, to your daily um, experience because all these symptoms in our classical books were symptoms of... End, of a lot of symptoms of end stages of diseases we never saw, and he brought them back to earlier stages, to more modern interpretations. Yes, of course, we, we use them, but in daily practice, they seem to be a little unsatisfactory to me, because we had to study hundreds of remedies, and we, in the end, used maybe 30. The polycrest, the remedies that always came up, because they were best um, uh, described in the books, the were most um, rubrics in the repertory, so we always came up with the same. So it was a good idea, but very limited. And then Sankran came and this um, basic delusion theory was much better, I found much better, but still kind of limited, because even these basic delusions seem to be shared by a lot of people and were in a sense quite common. For instance, delusion is despised, or delusion is looked down upon, or Delusion is abandoned. A lot of people seem to have this, and then we came up with the same uh, remedies. Um, and a lot of remedies, of course, we now don't have delusions. There are no delusions in the in the repertories, uh, or they are not complete rubrics, and we always limit it to the five or six who are listed. You know this. So then, when the uh, vital 
sensation uh, theory came up, we had a broader concept, which, by the way, brought back the body into the anamnesis, because the delusion prescriptions were almost exclusively on the mind, which was uh, criticized, right, rightly criticized, because it should be the totality, and now we were focusing almost only on the mind, and it was understandable, because in the hierarchy of symptoms, the mind is deeper or is more individual than the body, but the body, bodily symptoms, most often the reason why the patient visited us, were completely disregarded. And with this vital sensation concept, it came back in. And then we were again in line with Hahnemann, who says, you know, the distraught dynamics eh, expresses itself by signs and symptoms on mind and body. So this was good. <laughs> Was it a big step from delusion to the vital? No. In my case, it came quite naturally. Um, because many so-called delusions were vital sensations anyway. For instance, um, we have the delusion being fragile, made of glass, you know, Tsucha. Or we had the delusion poor, which in many cases uh, is, a, is a common sensation of all the fourth row minerals. Eh? Or we have the delusion shattered. And actually, this is a sensation. So now we could differentiate. It was a step forward to this uh, whole group of uh, symptoms who didn't mean the same thing to be able to discern different levels. Mm -hmm. so, but how do you know the difference? That's a good question. <laughs> As I said in the lesson on the levels, eh, the vital sensation is not a product of the mind. But of course, it translates itself uh, by the mind, because we have to use words. Words is the or talking, communicate, communication by words is the, the medium of the homeopath. You know, we don't touch our patients, we talk with our patients. We look at them and we talk. And talking is, is a, a mental activity. Yeah, it's, it's a set of symbols that we have to process by the mind. But it's a translation of something different. So the mind produces thoughts and images and Everything that we can explain logically are products of the mind, come from the mind. But for instance, irrational fears or, or irrational or, or dreams eh, are mostly expressions of something vital. The vital uh, sensation is an experience. It's not a thought, it's an experience in mind and body. Still, it seems a very subtle difference to me. It is and it is not. <laughs> we have to, actually, we have to question the patient. And question again and again, you can question or put the same question a few times to the patient yeah, to know the last answer. Even if you repeat the question, more can come until the patient can say no more, the deepest. And that is the experience. And in plant cases, and this is a bit subtle or a bit difficult, maybe you're pointing to that uh, situation, very often it is a more or less common sensation or a sensation that is common with emotional expressions. I give you an example. Um, uh, the emotion or the feeling, the feeling, we use the word feeling and this is a bit uh, confusing, I agree, we can have feelings on level 3, feelings on level 4 and feelings on level 5, it's a matter of language. Eh? In, in Dutch, for instance, it would be very funny to, to say experience, we would say feeling and still we would mean uh, the experience on the fifth level. So you can have the feeling of being hurt, of feeling shocked, of feeling obstructed, or the patient can talk about violence and we think it's story, or catastrophe, and we think it's story, and still, yeah, it is sensation. It is not emotion in that case, because emotion comes with a thought. For instance, something happened, you were criticized, and you feel not good enough. Yeah? Or you, you were laughed at, and you feel embarrassed. That's a feeling that an emotion that comes, a feeling that comes with a happening, something that happened, and then you think something, you feel something. You were scolded, and in return, you feel angry. Hmm? So it's not an emotion, whereas the vital? The vital is all levels, all of the time. Yeah, you know, emotion is only level three, hmm? and it comes very often, it comes from level four. But all levels, all of the time, I mean, it is in the mind, it is in the body, it is throughout time. 
when the patient tells of his childhood uh, uh, stories and memories, it will be there. It is at all levels, pathology, energy level, emotion, uh, mental level. It is at all his stories and anecdotes and all the happenings and his dreams and his uh, hobbies and his fascinations. It will always be there. The vital sensation will uh, uh, will always be found, not always in the same word, but then it will be a synonym of the same thing. So that's why you have to confirm on several levels. Uh, at least three times, then you're sure. Otherwise, you don't know. Maybe you have a local sensation. Oh, you can have a local sensation? What is this? Yes, we have local sensations, of course. This means when uh, the sensation, the experience is only felt on one level, or only in one story, or for instance, only in the pathology. I'll give you an example. This will make it perfectly clear. So let's say the patient has eczema and you ask questions. How is your eczema? How do you feel with this eczema? What is the impact of the eczema on you? You know, all other questions that we, uh, open questions we have to ask about this chief complaint. And the patient, for instance, says, oh, well, it's, it's itchy and I'm scratching and, and I'm always disturbed by it. And it's so irritating. It's so irritating. Uh, how do you say? Uh, irritating. irritating, yes. And, and then you think, oh, maybe it's it's uh, violalis because that's anger when disturbed and, and a lot of irritations and impatience. And, and then you go through your whole analysis and know where you can find this irritation or this anger or this aversion to be questioned or disturbed. So it's a local sensation. It's only in the eczema, it's not in the patient. Or it can be only in one story. For instance, the patient tells you, um, um, I have stress, hmm, which is very common, and you ask the patient, yes, tell me a little bit more about your stress, what is the problem, and he says, oh, at my, my work, I have a colleague, and, and she's really awful, you know, because she's trying to um, criticize me all of the time, and, and uh, I feel so attacked, and I don't know what to do with her, because it's a territory fight, because it's my uh, office, and, and and she takes more than... Um, than she should and, and I have to defend myself all the time and it's an ongoing fight and you think, mm hmm eh? animal kingdom, <laughs> because she uses all the words. But if there's no hint to animal kingdom in the chief complaint and there's no hint to any, uh, in any other anecdote or any other story or any other dream of an animal kingdom, then it's local. That's a local sensation. The local sensation in this patient is I have a fight eh? and I have to defend myself against the text but this is the story we all have fights and we all feel attacked now and then and that's that doesn't make us belonging to the animal kingdom this can be very localized realistic story and then it's only level three it's not level five so unless we can find it on different levels we can confirm it in different stories different anecdotes we're not sure could be animal, but we're not sure until it's confirmed. Thank you for all these general uh, outlines of mm -hmm. how you have to conduct mm -hmm. an analysis. Perhaps now we go into detail into uh, the schemes that you have provided mm -hmm. us with. So, um, I can see the first step is uh, about defining the territory. Yes, the first step, because more or less all analysis, more or less, have this structure. We don't want to we stay flexible. We don't want to limit it to these steps and, and, and do it in every case. But it turned out in practice that mostly it evolves in a very natural way in, this, in these three steps. So I try to um, give a kind of scheme as a navigator, as a help, as a map, in case taking. And this is my vital approach. This is based on, on uh, my mixture uh, of classical knowledge and my clinical experience. So in, indeed, the first step is defining the territory. That's what I call defining the territory. And then the second step is more of the same. Yeah? That's what I say. And the third step is confirmation by fears and dreams. So what do you mean by territory? Yeah, the territory. It's an image, yeah, of course. It's not literally. I'm, by territory, I mean that the patient will determine, define the territory where the treasure is hidden. The treasure yeah, is, of course, the remedy. And we are looking for the treasure. Yeah. And the patient will lead us. 
to the place where it is. Because we don't know. The patient knows. But of course he doesn't know he knows. <laughs> he has the experience something is wrong and he will lead us to the place where it's felt most. And then we will start to dig. In this particular territory we know the vital sensation is there. So the remedy is there. That's for sure. We don't know what it is, but we know where it is if we follow the patient to define the territory. Now this territory means, that's why I say it's an image, only means the subjects that the patient will bring. And we will talk of these subjects and nothing else. Whatever it is. One subject, okay, then we talked about we will talk about one subject in all details. Ten subjects we might have to choose and ask the patient. Uh, what is the most important for you? And they will choose themselves. They will say, I have this problem and that problem and the other. And, 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 and. And we say, okay, what is the most important? Let's start from there. And then the others will be, if you question them further, but we won't have the time, they will lead to the same vital sensation. We know that. Yeah. So, the opening question will be, what is the reason why you're here? What can I do for you? The patient will give you an answer. In this answer, you know, by, uh, by experience, can be very short, one sentence, can take three quarters of an hour. Eh? <laughs> this is defining the territory. This answer will exactly give you the outlines of the territory. We will talk about this, about that, about that. For instance, the patient can say, oh, my main problem is uh, sleeplessness. I tried every single thing and uh, I am on medication now. I want to get rid of the medication because it's toxic. Eh? And I have a minor thing, you know, this wart is a little bit, you know, I have it for a long time and I think warts on the hands is not very clean and people think you, you should do something about it. So a little bit embarrassed about this and, and um, maybe I don't know if homeopathy can do something about it, but you know, when I have to start to talk in public, I always feel uh, timid and, and it's hard to find my words. Good. This is, we have sleeplessness. Second level, that's good. We have warts, level one, pathology on the physical level, and we have uncertainty or insecurity when you have to talk in public. At least level three, maybe level four. And then we will ask the patient if there's anything more. If that's it, we will talk about only sleeplessness, warts, uncertainty, talking in public. That will be the case. There is the, re there is the remedy. Mm -hmm. uh, so you question about this. Uh, things that the patient brings up. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else uh, important in this first part? Of, of course. There's a, a lot of things happening mm -hmm. uh, always in, during anamnesis. A lot of things. So many things we often not aware of it. But what is very important, very important is observation. And we, uh, in our training, in CKH, we trained our students uh, in these observation skills, they did exercises to make explicit the implicit information they got when they see a patient. And so we practice a little bit and trying to translate this in rubrics, which is language. We have to uh, translate what we see, what, what we observe, have to translate this in rubrics as well. Very often this is overlooked and that's why I stress the importance of the context as part of the information you get. You get the content, of course. This is what the patient tells you. These are the words of the patient. This is what we know down. And in paper cases, mostly that's the only thing we have. I would say one third, one, the half of the information is missing when we only have the content. The context is how does the patient look? How does he behave? How does he talk? What impression does he make on you? How does he evolve throughout the case? So it is the way the information came to you. Was it fluent? Was it quickly? Was it, uh, was it with reluctance? Did we, did we have to push a lot? How did the patient uh, uh, move? All this information we have to bring into the final analysis. And this happens from the first second the patient walks in. Mm -hmm. 